So this is me. Um, first of all, you should understand that I'm going to talk about some strange things today because basically I'm a change agent, uh, also known as disruptor in the, in, the, in the literature now. So this is the, the, the uh, management literature talks about disruptors. It's sort of the role in an organization where you go in there and question everything. Um, and I do that pretty well. In fact, uh, I had a job description at one place uh, in London where I was described as the hand grenade being thrown into development. Uh, if you can get that job description, you always should take it. Uh, it's a lot of fun to do this. So basically, I probably go in there and do the things that, that Eric was talking about last night. I create that environment that Eric thinks is ideal for the programmers. That's kind of what I go in there and do. Um, and I have, you have a broad background. Obviously, I got, I've been doing this a long time. I wrote my first code in 1968. I still write code. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of tools to sort of make this disruption happen. But if some of the stuff you sounds weird today, it's because I tend to live on the bleeding edge. So this may be something you're not, not, not ready for now. Five years from now, hopefully, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So reason microservices is kind of springing up in parallel in lots of places. I notice that when I go to conferences, people are talking about microservices, gorgeous implementations that I've never even heard of them before. And so I think it came up for a lot of re com common reasons. And some of the common reasons have, have to be around the technology. So we got some technologies now that really allow competition to go attack. Whether you're a startup yourself attacking big companies or whether you're a big company being attacked, the fact that some technologies are there helps you do that. I mean, cloud computing, I no longer have to go out and spend millions of dollars on machines before I can, before I can have a system. I don't have to spend thousands of dollars on programmers you know, per day just to try to get systems up and take a year. I can start out with some of the stuff ahead of time. And I got frameworks now that just kind of let me go build a website within days that lets me sell things. That used to be a really long process. But also, it's happening on the business side. There's some business innovations that are occurring. Silicon Valley has provided us a model for how to run businesses. It's all about finding customers. You don't worry about trying to make money off of them. We can find customers, you can find investors. And so they provide you know, lots of role models for the startups to attack. Um, accelerating business needs, I can tell you that I put that on charts for the last you know, 35, 40 years. I expect Dave's done the same. <laughs> we always, it always goes faster. We think we're going fast, and we go faster. The other thing is, there's really nothing to stop your business from being attacked by some people sitting in India that allocate some space on the Dublin servers. And all of a sudden, they can be in your market and can siphon off your best customers because they can find them because of social networks. They can find your best customers and siphon them off at the top. So this is one of the reasons microservices is rising, because it lets you go do some of these things faster. The other thing it's sort of described is we're solving different problems today than we were solving back in the day when I started writing code. And I, I think this represents it quite nicely. This is the Kneffin model from a guy named Dave Snowden. It's not the other Snowden. It's Dave Snowden. He doesn't get any hits anymore, by the way. Um, and he kind of divides the world into pro different types of problems. He said simple problems are problems where the cause and effect is very, very straightforward. There's complicated problems where the cause and effect relationship is a little more convoluted but it exists, kind of the domain of the expert to help tell you how to do that. But he didn't stop there. He also said there are problems that are complex and chaotic. And complex problems are those problems where the cause and effect relationship cannot be figured out. Yeah, if something happens, you can probably figure out why it happened, but it does not help you predict the future. So these are things like most of your recommendation engines. Should I loan you money? Uh, are you a good credit risk? Uh, what books do you like to read based upon what you've read so far? These are sort of questions that are sort of complex. Financial markets, Google AdWords, complex problems. And complex problems cannot be solved with some of the same techniques you use with complicated. There isn't an expert. You can't, the manager can't tell you how to do it better because he has no idea. The expert can't tell you how to do it better because he has no idea. The cause and effect relationships are not discernible. And a lot of the organization structures that try to solve complex problems with the wrong organization structure struggle. One of the things Dave Snowden said is most problems you don't know the type of problem it is until you actually get in there and look at it and see how it behaves. Uh, and you have a tendency to drag a problem into your segment where you like to work. So if you're a politician, everything is simple. You elect me, I'll fix it. Uh, we'll raise the taxes, we'll lower the taxes. Whatever it's going to be, it's an easy problem. Of course, it's not. 
Um, you know, if you're an architect, you, th you must think, well, it's just complicated. I, everything is, I'm an expert. I can do these things. Just tell me, just give me a chance to do this stuff. But it may not be that type of problem. Myself, I tend to li like to live in chaos and, and complex worlds. So I'll tend to make things co you know, complex if, regardless. But this is the domain where a lot of the new businesses are coming up. It's a complex domain. And because the organization structure has been targeted for either simple or complicated problems, uh, a lot of organizations struggle when they get here. So again, we're solving new types of problems. We're not doing payroll all the time. We're doing, you know, what, why would you want to save money for your Christmas present? How do you want to, you know, do you want to save money for your next boat or something? And how do you motivate people to sort of save in your banks? So just a quick summary of microservice principles since I'm kicking off this track. Uh, there's probably general agreement among us that have been playing with this for a while about these very things. They're really, really small compared to what you've seen. We sort of argue about how small a small is, but it's kind of a moot point. Um, I think Adrian Cockroft, the guy who helped uh, the CTO to put together the Netflix stuff, uh, he sort of said, you know, team size of one is what he thinks. If a service takes more than one person to design and implement it and maintain it, it's not a microservice. I think all of us kind of agree with that to some degree, so we kind of like that idea. Loosely coupled as much as possible. We like the idea you run multiple versions at the same time because that makes you faster. Uh, services are kind of have to monitor for themselves to make sure that they are working correctly. It's kind of a responsibility of each service. And not, if it doesn't work, to sort of raise its hand and say, I'm not working. Uh, this one we kind of stole, or at least Google really exploited the hell out of this one, is that if you do something interesting, you should publish it. Don't worry about who needs it. That just takes too long. If you do something interesting, you should publish it. Somebody may find use for it in the future, but they don't want to come, to come find you to get you to change something. And so we kind of flip that model on its head. And the whole concept of these application boundaries, you know, forget that. It's all the boundaries become fuzzy in this world. So that's kind of the summary of the principles we're talking about. So we get on to the challenges. Um, and this is kind of a common theme behind all the challenges. And some of the, my preliminary questions sort of hit, hit on this. That is right now we're really inexperienced about what microservices do. We're just starting to play with this stuff in the last couple of years. And so right now, the things we're talking about are sort of still emerging. So take everything as being, OK, very, very early experiences. And you come back five years from now, and I expect some of the things we're saying are absolute nonsense. All right. So let's talk about some of the challenges associated with this. So one of the initial challenges is synchronous or asynchronous microservices. So this is kind of a very subtle point. But there's two ways to sort of build these microservices. And you'll see you know, most, most solutions falling into one or the other of these. Uh, interesting enough, I, I was on the stage with, uh, oops. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not the first one. Uh, first challenge is actually uh, technology choices. So the question is, you see microservices. Microservices is not an isolated technology. If you think about microservices being an isolated technology, kind of missing it. Microservices have been enabled by a lot of things happening at the same time. The cloud, uh, the emergence of event buses, certainly Docker and Cassandra and frameworks like that. But it's also you have all these things like agile, programming anarchy, and if you're there last night, you know the concept of one hacker way. Different ways of working. They're emerging as well. You got DevOps and full stack developers. You have entire conferences now about DevOps. And it's kind of an emerging idea that says, you know, you, you kind of take that and treat that differently now. And you got things like minimum viable product and lean startup movement, even on the business side. And there's a common theme running through all this stuff. And that is it's all about going faster. We're trying to figure out ways to go faster. If you really want to go faster, you say, well, first thing we'll do is microservices, and we're, we'll worry about some of the other stuff later, you will miss the point. You will not get your benefits. If you've got an organization that insists I'm going to have a, a dedicated ops team, and we're going to make sure we deploy on regular boundaries, and we're going to make sure our database stays up to date, microservices provide you nothing. You're going to have to buy off on a, on a couple of these things at the same time if you want your microservices to be successful. But you can go faster. Uh, so this is a, a chart. Uh, this comes from a company I worked with in uh, London. Uh, this is called the Forward Technology Group at the time. And basically, it was how fast can you go? And they, they actually published their GitHub stats. This was a team of 50 programmers, and they were deploying something new in production every three and a half minutes. So you think you're going fast now? You can probably go faster. And they adopted almost everything you saw on the previous chart to get that speed. 
Not all at the same time. They started doing it, but yeah, again, we want to go faster. What do we do, do next? DevOps. What about the next thing? Docker. They just keep nibbling at nibbling at problem to go faster and wind up doing almost everything on that chart. Okay, so that's actually the... Actually, I got my charts backwards here. So that was actually challenge number one, which is shown here as challenge number two. Is that it's not just microservices. That was the challenge one, one. Challenge two is synchronous versus asynchronous. So synchronous versus asynchronous, two styles of microservices. Um, I have a colleague, Chad Fowler. I think we know Chad, Chad really well. Uh, former thought worker himself, uh, worked in India. Um, he and I happened to be on the same stage talking about microservices a few years ago in Dublin. Uh, and he stood up there, described microservices, just nailed microservices absolutely, and said basically you should use the synchronous microservice strategies as default. In other words, here's a service, it basically invokes another service, probably RESTful calls with JSON, invokes another one, invokes another one. So that's kind of the architecture you want to put together. Because that's how people describe the problem. We're kind of used to that as programmers because this is more traditional structure. So he says that should be your default structure. I stood up after him and I basically said, yeah, it's really nice, uh, but Chad's all wrong about the answer. The answer is asynchronous. The idea that you want to basically really loosely couple these things, build your algorithms differently. And yes, it may be hard for your programmers, but you should teach your programmers. Now, what do I mean by an asynchronous architecture? So it sort of comes down to, this is one of my favorite metaphors for that. It happened to be, uh, at the time when I drew this, I had a new iPad, uh, and it was on an airplane, couldn't have else, anything else to do with my fingers, so I just kind of drew this out. But the idea is I call it rapids, rivers, and ponds. And it sort of starts up there in that upper right corner. One of the things that's happening in the industry is we're moving away from the concept of a relational database that understands the operations, it's not an operational database, and a reporting database. We kind of have these two databases because one, they have to optimize differently. One for inserts and updates, one for reporting. That, that top database, that, that operational database, is dying. And then you look at Silicon Valley, it's been replaced many times by an event bus. So rather than saying that you know, I'm going to keep track of every entity perfectly across my enterprise, it's kind of like this is your email address today and you change it. These are two valid data points. Don't really keep just the last one, keep them all, because they may be interesting. And so the idea of this is, is to take these sort of th events that are going on and put them in basically a bus and have every single event going on on that bus. That includes your log messages, includes traffic stats, includes user journeys, as well as the sort of messages running through that. And that's a massive amount of information. So you want to kind of pull off the messages from that rapids into a river, slower meandering water has, has a little more uh, theme to it. So pull it off and attach your services to that. You still have a need to have static information for reports. Because frankly, reporting and SQL databases do work really well together. But basically, you, you do that by sitting here listening to the rapids, and if you happen to see an email address change, we'll update the record. If you get a new customer, well, you would insert on the customer record. But sit there listening to the rapids, make your changes to your, your, your reporting databases. I call those pawns because they're stagnant. They've lost that time nature of the information. So that's kind of the metaphor that we, we've been talking about doing uh, relative to asynchronous services. And it creates some very interesting new architectural patterns, sort of based upon the fact that I have a high capacity event bus. Um, and there are a couple of these out there. My favorite right now is Kafka. Uh, Kafka is the bus that LinkedIn uses. So again, everything going on when you touch LinkedIn, every time you talk about your, your, your reference somebody, look up somebody, little events being generated, lots of little applications being springing up, doing all sorts of analysis of that, and et cetera. And so the, the Kafka bus actually is really dumb at some level, but really, really fast. You can put a quarter of a million messages a second on that bus. Quarter of a million messages. Very few of your applications probably could, cannot choke that bus. With, uh, take every one of your log messages, take your user journeys, take your traffic stats. You're not going to you know, load that bus down. Now, the great thing about LinkedIn is they gave this away. So this is now an Apache project. The documentation of the Apache website is excellent. Really motivates the whole bus. Um, unfortunately, when you say 250,000 messages a second, they cheat in how they count. So write a message once, you read it 10 times, that counts for 11 messages. So you put 100 guys on this guy, all of a sudden, maybe it's not such high capacity. So you tend to put little things on the side. I like to use ZeroMQ for this. Put a little service on the side and create a river. 
So the idea is I'll, I'll pull every message off, I'll put the ones I kind of like, and I'll pass it on to my children. So my, basically, my services will attach to a river so they don't choke the bus and take capacity out of the bus. But they'll, of course, always publish to the rapids. Uh, by the way, Kafka buses and debugging, everything that happened in your system is on there already. You don't have to go to your log files and try to correlate those and put your other events together and traffic stats and get all the time machines. It's already there. You start debugging, 90% of your debugging is already done by having it on one stream. It's a very powerful concept. So that's, this sort of architecture now allows us to build some uh, different sort of styles of applications. Click. OK, click works this way. Or not. There we go. Um, so a new style of application, sort of, sort of asynchronous services. So when I talk about asynchronous microservices, I mean sort of really decoupled along these sort of lines. So another architectural pattern that sort of emerges is something we call the need pattern. So basically, if you're a service here, you just kind of put on the bus that says, I need something. He who came and applied for a loan, do I want to lend you money? That's a need. And then hopefully, there's some guys down there listening for this need. And they'll provide some solutions. So the blue service may say, you know, a couple of different opinions about whether they should lend you money. The green service has its own opinion. You collect these opinions and basically make a decision. The nice thing about this is it's easy to go write version 2 of the blue service and run it at the same time. You don't have to tell that blue service about it. You don't have to tell the yellow service. The green service could care less. It's easy to do. You just try your different things again and again. Very powerful architecture for the complex problems by the Kinefin model. The nice thing about this, easy to put variations in there. But also, if the green service goes down, we're still running. We're getting opinions. We're making guesses anyway, but the system still runs. Extremely robust. Of course, you know, when the green guy just goes down, there's all sorts of other bells and whistles going out to try to get him back up, but the system hasn't stopped itself. So a very powerful sort of architecture around that. Yes? Can I ask a question? Probably you should hold the question. Because, um, we, yeah, I'll go, I'll go into an action animation of, of this in action, which will generate even more questions. But that's what your iPad app's for. You know, you fill these on your phone. So let's say I got a, a website associated with uh, renting cars. We'll call it a Hertz. Um, and so you got a website doing that, some, some you know, legacy web server doing that. So if I want to put basically some advertising in these slots. I want to try to target some advertising to you based upon choice, because I can make some more money off you. We, we call this share of wallet. Well, I want a higher share of your wallet when you come to my site. So I'll put a high performance bus in there, put myself a little service to sort of interface to the existing system a little microservice of its own right, write myself a couple of services that are going to provide offers to you. So I have a corporate level little service running that has love, uh, inf uh, information at probably the company level. So if it's Hertz, maybe it's a weekend program they want to rent on. But each individual Hertz location can have its own little service running that's sort of tuned to themselves. They can say I have a surplus of a certain type of vehicle. I like to put those on sale and get those rented out as well. And they're running independently of each other. But I can also add some complementary services here like segmentation uh, or membership. Membership is, a, you know, are you a member of our frequent renter program? One of the things they've realized, you know, companies like this have realized is if you're already a customer, it's way easier to hold on to you than it is to basically uh, try to win you back. So you should offer discounts to your current customers just to sort of keep them around, make them keep them happy. Uh, segmentation means I kind of divide the world up into, you know, how you behave. It turns out if you rent cars during the week, during the week you probably are doing a corporate travel. You don't pay for the car. So putting an advertisement up there that says give you a discount, not very worthwhile. On the other hand, if you do rent during the weekends, you are probably paying for it. You do like discounts. So it's something I can tune quite nicely. So how does this work in action? So I bring up a web page that sort of says I have an opportunity to put some ads up there. This little guy will publish a little message to the bus. These guys here care about that because they're basically listening for any event that's associated with that, so they pick up that message. These guys, until you know who it is, they can't do anything, so they, can, they don't care about that message. Uh, these guys basically come up with solutions of their own, push these solutions up. We take those solutions. We listen for those solutions back in the little green box. And we would kind of do a redirect and post those messages to the... Um, to the web page. 
Uh, notice that I'll do a redirect because this is not a data bus. It's an event bus. So I'll probably just carry around in a message a URL that says go to this URL and it has all the content you want to show on that page. I wouldn't put it on the bus itself. All right, so now I actually, you know, comes along and I find out if Sally actually logs in or I dropped a cookie on her site, I know who she is. That generates a more interesting message with more information. Of course, everybody cares that, in fact, which Sally is here now. So they all pick that up and take that message. Again, now, now these guys know that Sally is an existing customer. That's enough information that says, okay, I got a better offer for an existing customer. So let's you know, make a better offer for that. So they make different offers based upon that additional information. Push that up. Now, the interesting thing happens at this point. Obviously, those messages get collected by the first guy. But you can, this message comes down to the membership. Membership says, oh, Sally, she's platinum. She's one of our really, really, really good customers. Uh, that would get everybody excited. So basically, the, the membership stuff just adds more information to the packet and pushes that packet up. And it clicks, it clicks. Finally, yes. Um, so notice that you haven't got a solution yet, but it's more information. I took the original information about, you know, I got somebody here, her name is Sally, and I said, oh, wait, Sally's platinum. Of course, these guys down here, it's another offer as far as they're concerned, another opportunity because they know more. So you push that message to everybody else. And, of course, now that I know that Sally's not only a, a, you know, only, only a current customer, but Sally's also a platinum, you get really excited for platinum people. You do not want them to go to Avis. Uh, so you basically pull those up, and you keep collecting these messages as well. And you keep going on and on. And we'll add segmentation information, et cetera. That's an asynchronous microservice. Notice that the, you publish some message into the bus, you don't know anybody's listening. You have to sort of design your algorithms to handle that. But notice if I have a better idea for how to do corporate advertising, I just pop it on the bus, try it out. Deployment's really, really fast in that environment. So you sort of have a service taxonomy in this sort of architecture. First of all, you have a lot of different channel interfaces, according to what type of browser you're supporting, or you're supporting an iOS device or an Android device, whole different microservice for each one of those, because they're different. But you have all these sort of processing services sitting on the bus. You saw an example of uh, solution services and the enrichment services, the ones that add the segmentation or the other stuff. But you can also be keeping track of what I've showed Sally. So if I show Sally an advertisement five times, she still hasn't clicked on it, don't show it again. And I got a service sitting there looking at you know, what we're showing Sally and, and why she's taking it. And also I got guys sitting here looking at Sally's existing reservations. Sally already has a reservation in Houston. If she already has a reservation, why would I want to give her a discount for Houston? I'm just giving money back. So block those sort of solutions. So again, another service I can add in there, make it a little more sophisticated. I basically am building myself an incremental system where I'm continually improving the system as I go, as I get more and more ideas. Uh, by the way, um, we built one of these systems for a hotel chain. Um, we charged them $3 million to build the system. Uh, I think they made $40 million additional revenue in the first six months of a pretty simple system otherwise. And they were arguing about how they should have bought some IBM product for that instead. And you're like, no, it's up and running. You just made $40 million. Go away. Um, so, yeah, Richmond Service kind of just re adds the information to it and republishes the packet back on the bus. These guys are providing their information. And you sort of you know, adjudicate among these things, judge among the services, things you want to show with that. Also, it's, to your point, logging and monitoring is very, very important because you need to have some idea what's going on. But it turns out extremely powerful is the cap capability of watching and measuring your KPIs. If all your events are on the bus, I almost guarantee I can put a KPI monitoring up there. How much money am I making? When did I make a sale? Those sort of KPIs can be monitored and monitored very aggressively just by hanging something on the bus. So a very, very powerful concept behind this as well. So asynchronous, this sort of style, which is a different style of algorithm, very much kind of like when MapReduce came along, all our old algorithms don't work. We have to have new versions for MapReduce in order to get, take advantage of that. Asynchronous kind of has that same challenge. So your program's not going to be used to that. But has huge advantages in terms of deployment speed, the ability to do A-B testing built into it. So that's kind of your first challenge. You want to go to synchronous, which is kind of easier for your programmers, or asynchronous, which has enormous business benefits. OK. Challenge number three, the database. 
So it turns out that the database itself, um, it's kind of like you got to basically tear it apart. The concept of having this big operational database is the thing that's going to slow you down. Because every, I was actually listening to a microservice presentation in Australia uh, last year, and the guy stood up and told an amazing story about how fast it can deploy as long as there's no migration of the database. And I'm like, wow, that kind of is a pretty big constraint. Uh, yeah, if you touch the database, we have to slow down. It's, it's very, very crawl. So you have to tear this thing apart. In fact, Chad Fowler is now at uh, Six Wonderkinder in Berlin. First thing he did was basically tear his database down into lots of small databases, then started building services around that concept. So you've got to tear the database down. So you know, the challenge you come up with is how many databases should you have? Um, and the answer is, you know, if, if you're talking to sort of the, the people in the big companies, the answer is I want to have one. Because obviously an entity database is absolutely perfect, is perfect for my business, and that's been the holy grail. In fact, I was talking to, in a different hotel chain, I was talking to the chief scientist, or chief architect rather, and I say, well, how many databases do you have? Well, I'm a troublemaker, so I asked the question. He said, well, I have three, I'm trying to get down to two, I'm really embarrassed by that. And I told him, by the way, the answer is 300. It's the last conversation we ever had. Which is kind of okay because he was going to talk to his vendor after this meeting to tell him about this new waterfall process. I didn't really want to talk to him either. So what's what happening is we're going to this, basically this event bus. It's being sort of the operational, quote, database of some sort. And so basically each little microservice, you have to have persistent, has its own little store holding what it needs to do its job, but nothing more. So very wet, wet little things. And you can use whatever database makes sense. Just because you need a relational database with, with uh, transactions doesn't mean all the rest of us are stuck with using SQL Server. We can use the database of choice that we need to use. Very powerful concept. It turns out only about 10% of the databases are actually written into, most are read-only. And only a temp, probably 10% of that 10% are actually transactional, in my experience. So there's only about 1% of the databases need to have the transactional databases. So I put one there. Put a SQL Server, um, put a MySQL, whatever you want to do there. So example of sort of some of these databases, going back to this example. So this little guy up here, the green guy in the corner here, wh which was basically just pumping out little messages and, and collecting solutions, I'm probably setting him up as running four different containers. I got somebody up there sitting at the top, the event publishing, who basically says when the page comes up, I publish, publish an event to the bus. And then I basically have another piece of code that's sitting there collecting all the answers and putting them in a Redis database, also running its own container. And if I happen to be supporting IE6, then I'll probably wait for 300 milliseconds, look in the Redis database for the best solution so far, and I'll push it to the, to the web page. If, I get, if you come back to the same page, I got all sorts of great answers already cached. I, I run it that way. So four different containers. But I call this one microservice because it's sitting around one little database, which is a pretty simple little database. It says, you know, Sally, these are the offers we found for Sally for. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, similarly, down here for the membership database, uh, membership sitting here, basically, it's just a, just a look up between Sally and what level of, of membership he is. So it's a quick little service doing that. A little key value store is all I need. It's, I'm probably refreshing this every night from the data warehouse to see what the latest is. And I'll probably, it's unlikely they could actually export key value pairs. So I'll write myself a little microservice that runs into the, the corporate database, pulls it out, builds my key value store. And by the way, if this doesn't run tonight, that's okay. I'm running with slightly outdated data. I can live with that. It's a pretty robust system. So again, little databases all over the place in this architecture. So that's the thing you have to worry about. Is you've got to tear down the database to be effective with microservices. Fourth challenge. This one is a big, I, I, I feel a little uncomfortable with this one because I'm, I'm not basically a closure programmer, kind of a really novice closure programmer. But it seems like that you have a choice of either using microservices or closure, or functional programming languages in general. Uh, so let me sort of go into why I think this is kind of a, an important question. Because both of these are actually very powerful technologies. And she wants to click. So in my world, microservices are a lot like object-oriented programming. I did a lot of, I've done object programming for, God, since late 80s. And so this is kind of my idea of how I carve up my systems. I, I try to make as many classes as possible as long as they do something interesting. If you use the word and in a definition of a class, I, I, make, it means I make two classes. Uh, we try to minimize the communication. We have persistence. Of course, persistence now means you're in a little database. So basically, it's the same sort of design principles for microservices that 
we stole from uh, object-oriented programming concepts. But look at a sort of a closure program and how closure programs look. Closure loves shared data. The whole concept of you know, this sort of functional programming is that we like this concept of immutable data. Uh, and yes, it's not all about immutable data, but it's an aspect of it. So what you wind up doing is you write a lot of transforms and take some form of data, move it to another form of data, whatever. Um, we did this, by the way, at the Daily Mail. Uh, we used Clojure to take basically a JSON representation of all the content we want on all our web pages, and went through some transforms to change to HTML. A uh, very successful project. But you look at these little data structures in the middle, you get sort of these arrows, what's in the arrows, and what you see is it's kind of a, a, a map of a hash of a map of an array of hash of maps. It's come kind of really complex data structure that's passed to the next phase to let him do this next transformation. It's not very likely another service wants this data. It's very, very tuned to the functions themselves. And so why would I separate each one of these yellow things into its own microservice when I'm passing around these massive structures of data that are basically immutable? So that's sort of a question I have in my mind. And, and in fact, I've had experience now with, in three different companies trying to play with this stuff. So I'm going to sort of show you how many services we had, the language we wrote them in, and, and sort of to some degree how we coupled them together. Um, so we'll start with Forward. That was a company in London. Uh, uh, I was with them. They, we did our first microservice implementation around 2008. We have over 300 microservices running. Um, we run them in Ruby for front-end stuff, Node.js for traffic monitoring, Clojure for heavy lifting. Uh, we did R for some interesting analysis of data. Uh, originally, we, we kicked these things off with cron jobs, then we went to RESTful interfaces, and finally we went to a more asynchronous structure with Kafka buses. So, so very much the stuff I described is, is things that we came up with at Forward. Then I went to the Daily Mail. Um, and we had Clojure doing the heavy lifting of doing the page transformations, but I wouldn't call them microservices. There's only three of them. It was 4,000 lines of Clojure, but 4,000 lines of Clojure, you can move the earth. They're not microservices in any way whatsoever. But we, all our traffic monitoring was done with Node. And they were really tiny. In fact, the average service was around 18 lines of code. They were really, really small. We had lots and lots of them. And we used RabbitMQ as kind of the communication mechanism. So again, closure, but not really microservice closure. They were kind of much more heavy than that. And then I went on to work in a, a startup in California where we're doing a lot of things like this in, oh, I think we call it offer engine, the thing that I should with Hertz. We had about 25 uh, services originally written in all enclosure. We used a little orchestration in RabbitMQ, but interestingly enough, the number kept shrinking because somebody would say, well, why do I want to you know, put this as a separate service? Why, can't, why don't I put these two services together? Because the communication between them is this heavy, heavy data stuff. Why do I need these separate services? So I'm kind of feeling like maybe there's some conflicts between using Clojure with its concept of large data structures and, and the like, or moving to sort of uh, microservices. Uh, there is kind of a new hope on the horizon. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful I'll, I'll learn some things here. And that's basically um, Elixir. If you haven't heard of Elixir, it's basically a functional programming language written on the Erlang virtual machine. And of course, it has lots and lots and lots of little processes running. They kind of feel, have a feel like microservices. So I'm hoping I'll learn something by playing with this language some. But functional programming or microservices, I'm not sure that they're not somewhat in conflict with each other. All right, fifth challenge. What are you going to use for your architectures and frameworks? And the problem here, of course, is we're new. We haven't really, we've been still playing with it. These concepts of spring frameworks and their equivalents sort of emerging up uh, hasn't happened yet. Uh, it probably won't happen for quite a while. The good news is uh, there's some candidates coming out there really quick. Uh, first one I would point out is there's a lot of open source frameworks that play with this stuff. Um, Netflix being the champion here. Uh, Netflix, by the way, is very much a synchronous microservice architecture versus the asynchronous stuff I showed you, very much a synchronous structure. They write in Java, um, uh, and they have some very, very powerful frameworks that sort of allow them to have all the A-B testing and whatever. There are over 40 open source projects coming out of Netflix about how to do things. In fact, uh, this is kind of the stack that a, a lot of large companies are beginning to use in the US. I know the Department of Defense in the US is, using, is building a new application on a Netflix stack. It's extremely robust, extremely powerful. By the way, Adrian Cockroft again would say, uh, 
it's probably beyond the capability of any one person to understand all 40 of these frameworks. Are, some of these things are quite complicated, but very, very powerful nevertheless. Uh, the other interesting thing that's happening is the uh, Node community themselves. The Node community is getting very active in microservices. Uh, they tend to have that core philosophy that says a library should only do one thing anyway. So the concept of building small s and small functions is part of their nature. And you're starting to see a lot of frameworks come out of these guys. Seneca, these are, this is out of a company in Ireland, uh, Nearform. Um, they embrace microservices. Uh, Renical is this one. Interestingly enough, it uses ZeroMQ, which is one of my little favorite frameworks. So a lot of these things and that thing emerging, but still it's kind of an open, open season on what actually is going to be great frameworks. Um, I think I saw recently an advertisement from IBM that said, yeah, WebSphere now supports microservices. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> you bring up a whole WebSphere for a microservice? No. Um, so people are getting in on it even though it's not necessarily a good idea. All right, next challenge. Um, Despite the, the fact we really need it at this point, we haven't got the Gang of Four book yet. We haven't got a design patterns book for microservices. Yes, some books are starting to appear. Um, the one by, oh, I keep forgetting, Sam Newman. Uh, Sam Newman just published one of the first books about this stuff. Everything Sam says is actually gorgeous. It's well worth the read. He doesn't talk at all about asynchronous services, but a lot of the infrastructure you need to worry about is covered very, very nicely in that. But it's not a patterns book. It's not something you pull out and say, here's a problem, and here's how you should solve it. The recipes aren't there yet. So that's still yet to come. Uh, the good news is uh, the microservice community itself is getting together and talking about microservices. Uh, there's some new dedicated conferences to that. Um, this one was in Berlin at the beginning of the year. Uh, there's another version of this be, be in February of next year. I, I was in two weeks ago, I was in Poland at a dedicated microservice conference as well. So it's starting to emerge as well. So, this is where a lot of these things are happening. We're sharing our stories with each other. I think some of the, the patterns will emerge from these sort of conferences. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the meetup groups are, are legion. They're running all over the place. Silicon Valley's had one for quite a while. Uh, the one in Ireland started up not too long ago. I love their logos. So much more interesting logos than everybody else. But you know, basically, they were they're getting into that. So people are getting together and sharing their information. And if you happen to be playing with microservices yourself, find yourself a group to talk about it. You know, share your experiences, get, get, collect the knowledge from the other people as well. Because we don't have the pat gun patterns yet. There are a lot of bad things we can try and we'll fail on. Now, last couple of challenges we need to worry about is, first of all, and this kind of goes back to that first slide about going faster, we've got to interact with the business differently. The way we're interacting with business with traditional Agile is outdated. Uh, if you certainly went to the presentation last night, uh, you sort of got a, a taste of that as well. And that's my experience as well. To some degree, we kind of have always assumed that the conversation about what to build needs to change. Um, I grew up in the days of the stone tablets. Um, we, we basically, you know, put the requirements. In fact, to some degree, the fact we have a requirements process like this is kind of my fault. Uh, well, not personally my fault, but my generation's fault. Back when I started writing a program, a big program was 1,000 lines of code. I mean, a monster was 2,000. So I sat down with the customer and write it, because I can write that much code. That's not a big deal. When it got to be 60,000 lines of code, some of the operating systems, you had to have a team. And that means the team has to work with each other. It gets a little more unpredictable. And all of a sudden, we started telling the customers, why don't you tell us what you need? We'll go build it for you. And we got really good at telling them to go away. And that's kind of what we came with stone tablets. So that's why you have to write this thing in stone tablets. You have to sign it in blood. This is what you want to have. And we built our industry around having these concepts of doing that. That, is, that works really well when you know what you want to build. But if you're working in the complex segment, as, Kenneth, as the Geneffen model talks about, you don't know what you need to build. My favorite story is, what's the difference between a customer and a used car salesman? Answer, a used car salesman knows he's lying. <laughs> so a customer says, this is what I want. It's like, I don't believe you. Let's try it, see what happens. So we're moving much more into the fact that we're trying to try ideas out. We want to move into an environment where we're trying things out, which means a much, much closer relationship. Treat the customer as somebody who has an idea. Come and tell us about it. Um, this is a mantra we use at Forward. Experimentation drives innovation. I love that because experimentation means we will try things and fail. We call them experiments just to set the expectation we will fail. My role in a lot of these companies has been when things break, and people complain about that, I tell them to shut up. We're going to go keep going fast. Oh, no, if you have some more meetings, we won't have this problem. If we have a spec, we won't have this problem. 
we're going to go fast. Shut up. That means also that, you know, the sort of the Agile pyramid is kind of messed up as well. So a few years ago, actually almost a decade ago, I drew this with a colleague at ThoughtWorks. And we, you know, everybody has talks about stories. We break stories into tasks. But one of our observations were tasks are sort of, stories are part of a features. Features are part of projects. Projects can be tied to some overall business initiative. And almost all the Agile processes say we should interact at the story level. That's kind of nice. More often than not, when I go to a stand-up meeting and look at a client, they're talking about tasks at stand-up meetings. What tasks do you finish? How long did it take? Why did your work take so long to work on these things? No fun is being had. What we really want to do, though, is actually interact at the feature level. I want the business to tell me what you're trying to accomplish, give me some KPIs, and then go away. Let me alone. You want to, you want to figure out how to work things? I'm, I'm good at algorithms. That's what I'm really good at. Turn me loose, tell me what the KPIs are, I'll figure out a way to win. Trying ideas out. So we need to interact at a whole different level than what Agile says we're interacting with in order to make this work well. Also, it turns out the other challenge we have, next to the last challenge, is the roles are outdated. If you think about some of the titles we have, they're names of the steps of the waterfall process. All our titles are associated with the waterfall process names. Not necessarily a good starting point for this sort of stuff. So uh, we basically have basically over-specialized to a large degree. The theory, of course, of specialization is that specialists are more productive, so we want to make sure we exploit a specialist. What we realize, of course, is the overhead of communication among ourselves, among the specialists, has been completely underestimated. And you wind up with these huge imbalances of workloads and a lot of inefficiencies. And you keep worrying about you know, more meetings about why don't we have enough front-end developers, we need to hire some more. Oh, you can't work on front-end because you're a back-end developer. So, you know, again, I run across this a lot, and my, and my challenge is to try to fix things. So I, you know, basically, titles have institutionalized a lot of this stuff. So, in fact, I was working again at the Daily Mail. Um, there were 50 IT professionals in the group I was working with between ops and, and QAs and scrum masters and et cetera. There were 25 titles. <laughs> and there was zero people who knew what we were doing. So we got to fix this sort of stuff. And uh, a much longer story about how we, how we handled that at the Daily Mail. But this is kind of, again, tearing down the structure, rebuilding something much more along the lines of what uh, Eric was talking about last night. So you got to fix this as well. If you don't fix these organizational issues, you will not be successful in microservices. So my final one is, and I, I label it sort of uh, challenge nine through N. And that is we got this going to have the same problem here as we have with Agile. Everybody's going to claim they're Agile. Everybody's going to claim, yeah, we're doing microservices. We need to sort of be very explicit about what we mean when we say we're doing microservices. We need to label it in a little more precision than we're doing microservices. Uh, it's an easy term to throw around, particularly it's in vogue. So I think we ought to be talking about, you know, give me a taxonomy. What do you mean when you say microservices? Not that you're wrong, but let's, let's be precise about what we're talking about. And there are you know, maybe, maybe three dimensions I've been thinking about so far. Uh, you know, are, are you synchronous or asynchronous? Is, and you're never 100% one or the other. But, you know, what is, what's your preference? Are you preference to, to asynchronous or your preference to a synchronous style? Uh, Netflix, clearly preference to synchronous. They have some asynchronous stuff, but preference to synchronous. Things like the offer engine, very much asynchronous. It's got some synchronous stuff in there occasionally, but we default as asynchronous. Uh, you know, how big are these things and how many do you have? And tell me about your databases. If you have one database and lots of microservices, you're not there yet. That won't work. So I'll wrap up with sort of this graph of uh, I drew. Uh, I've been drawing a lot of graphs lately. It's one of the things you do when you get older is you want to reminisce about things. Uh, so I've been reminiscing about lots of things. Um, so this is a log-log scale. Just get your head around that log-log. You, you remember that back in school. Um, sort of a log-log scale. So it's the size of the application and lines of code. I know it's not a very popular thing, but it works. And you know, how many services do you have? So I call that the Rails and Java zone, because uh, I spend a lot of time in Rails and Java applications trying to get them fixed. And it's basically one giant application with lots and lots of code in it. Um, I was around also for the beginnings of some of the SOA stuff. Had a chance to work with some bright people in ThoughtWorks that were early SOA pioneers. And you have somebody like Credit Suisse sitting there with maybe 50 services. Uh, but there were like 50,000 lines of code each. And that was, again, you know, they broke it up very nicely. You got a lot of benefits from doing that. And that was the SOA world. I think this is the microservice world. 
It's more like almost a 10 to 1 ratio is kind of the boundary here, the line here. In other words, uh, you know, I have that. And so you sort of, I worked on a lot of stuff in that zone. I will never do that again. It's not fun. Uh, I don't have to do that anymore. Good. You may be stuck with it for a while longer. Uh, that animation I showed you sits about there. We actually, uh, at, a, at a workshop I run, we actually implement what you saw in that engine. So we spend a day and we write that code. So we have about 15 services. They're never 100 lines of code or less. They're always 100 lines of code or less. Uh, that Ford group I talked about, they had over 300. That's where they sit. And Netflix, right there. They have over 800 services. They run about one to 2,000 lines of code, Java each. Um, but that's, they're basically in a microservice world. So plot, if you're doing microservices, plot yourself on the chart. If you're sitting over in this area, you're probably not micro yet. Um, it's much more different than that. So a uh, good point to wrap up here. If you want more information about this, it's becoming available. You know, very much like this presentation, there have been a lot of videotapes being shot. I think almost all the stuff from the conference in Berlin is actually online now. Some of it's in German, so if you speak German, you get more, more than I can read. Um, but yeah, go, basically just Google for stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there now. Um, there's also books. There's also some, a lot of stuff on these uh, other topics about uh, one I call my managerless process programmer anarchy. Um, but obviously, you, know, you should look at some of the stuff that uh, Eric talks about as well. But you know, go out there and research some of that stuff. And we'll wrap up by saying, you know, give, us, give your session a rating, please, uh, and bring your questions. And what, I got four minutes? Oh. I never finish early. This is good. <laughs> we got a lot of questions, but I can't read it without my glasses. You're going to have to pick, pick some for me. Hello. Yeah, I'll pick one. Um, one ask just says testing. What about testing and microservices? Oh, well, I'll take, all, I'll take another 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, uh, it turns out if you're using the really, really small microservices that I do with asynchronous, we tend not to, first of all, do unit testing on these things. Because frankly, they're so small, it's like, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it's pretty obvious what went wrong. And we're deploying them so fast. Uh, basically, integration test is dead. In fact, it's been dead a long time. You didn't realize it, but it's been dead. But it's been replaced by active monitoring. You want to take your running system and instrument that. And so it always is testing itself. Because now that we're building you know, complex applications that have lots of external services, you want to know when an external service has changed their API or down. You don't get that in the sterile environment called integration testing, where you hand it over to a group and make sure it works. So we, it's not that we don't write them, but we write them in terms of active monitoring. Uh, if you're using asynchronous services, the KPIs are amazing black box test. You want to know what's going on, measure your KPIs. So basically, that's what we did at Forward. We would have KPIs up. We were working in domains that had fast feedback. You know, Google AdWords, for example, we're doing Google advertising. 20 minutes after you do something, you can get results. So basically, we monitor the KPIs. We put something out there, whoa, look at the traffic, it goes up. Put something out there, whoa, it goes down. Not sure why it went down. In fact, sometimes we take it off, it still goes down. It wasn't our fault. Another tsunami in Japan, perhaps. But KPIs provide a very, very powerful integration mechanism. I know a trading house in London that are constantly basically doing, doing active deployments. They just deploy it constantly to the environment. But they're always buying and selling things constantly in testing mode. So they'll spend $10, buy some IBM stock, then sell it. So they're always running transactions through that to make sure they know when something goes down. But they're confident that when they push a $100,000 transaction through, it'll go through. So testing is kind of have two answers. One, if it's too small to even bother writing a unit test, don't write one. Uh, by the way, they do write unit tests in Netflix for the you know, one or 2,000 lines of code of Java. It's Java. It's one or 2,000 lines of code, probably worth unit testing. Uh, not so much when you're writing, you know, Node.js services and it's 18 lines of code. Okay. So testing, very interesting changes. Yeah, and another one, if we can have, have the time, um, talks about the projection problem. So uh, w if you have a lot of different views on the same piece of code, do you just keep adding new uh, projections and, and views? Or what do you do? I'm not sure what you mean by additional views. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I mean, it, it certainly if I have one service up and I have another idea for a different type of service, I'll bring them both up in parallel. And if I like the way the first one, if the first one gives me better answers, I throw the new one away. If the new one gets me better answers, I throw the first one away. Uh, sometimes you do like Netflix, and, and Netflix actually live test everything. So when you deploy something in Netflix, they basically will take a subset of you, and you will be using the new Netflix stuff. 
And if it crashes, they'll all of a sudden say, oh, excuse me, we'll hit the restart on your movie, and of course, they will start back up with the old code. But they'll basically just segregate their users and test in live environments. Um, so basically, you want to set yourself up so basically you can have multiple versions out there. If you think you are only have one version of something out there, you're going to go really slow because of that. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.